And so welcome everybody, excited to have you here tonight. And it's really lovely to see faces we know and new faces as well. My name is Curry Sautner. Um, I'm excited to have you all here tonight. We're gonna be here for about an hour and a half. And this is a, uh, a meeting and we love that because so often Tom and I do webinars and we never get to see anybody on the other side. So it's gonna be fantastic for us to see your faces. It would be great to have your camera on. It keeps us energized and moving along at the late night hour. Um, but we also want it to be as informal as you want it to be. So if there's spots along the way that you want clarity, wanna ask questions, feel free to unmute yourself, pop in, ask a question, put it in the chat. Kevin's here as well, and he's gonna help make sure I don't miss the chat, which I do quite often. But please, let's keep this as conversational as possible. If the topic is constitutional conversations, let's keep it an open dialogue as we go. So let me give everybody a kind of a little frame of reference about who we are, what we do, and just make sure we're all on the same page. So welcome, glad you're all here. First, we're gonna start with who we are. Um, so first, I'm Curry Sautner, Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. I've been at the center for about 16 years and I oversee all the education that we do in the building and online. So definitely a fun job, but I do not do it alone. I have lots and lots of people with me, around me and leading me. Um, and one person I get to work with a lot is Tom Donnelly. So Tom, you wanna do welcome introduction? Hi everyone, I'm Tom Donnelly. I'm a senior fellow for constitutional studies at the National Constitution Center, which means that I do a little bit of everything. I teach our public sessions for our online classes for students. I work on our exhibits. I work on our programming, our podcast, you name it. It's, uh, it's a constitutional feast and I love it. And I can't wait to, uh, to have a conversation with you tonight. Constitutional cornucopia. This is a perfect theme for exactly. next week. I love it. Uh, we also get to work with Kevin Lynch and Kevin's our education coordinator as well and fantastic in so many areas. And just like Tom, he's all over the place too and doing so many roles. So Kevin, do you want to introduce yourself and some of the amazing work that you do at the center and for the center? Of course. So good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin. I am the education coordinator at the center. I've been with the center since 2012. Uh, the majority of that time has been doing programs on the floor, um, but in the last year or so, I've transitioned more to working with Curry and Sarah Harris, our director of education, um, with the private exchanges, and I've gotten to see some of you there, and it's nice to see you again, um, so I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation this evening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to have you all here. I'm gonna walk through a little bit about the NCC and kind of our learning framework. And then we're gonna dive really quickly into doing a walking tour of the constitution and then constitutional methods. And then we'll apply all of that information to how do we have and set up a civil discourse. What we think and really understand that tonight's goal is, is just to give everybody kind of a taste and feel of some of the work that we do, some of the research that we've done and kind of the tools that we've built in working with students across the country and with schools and teachers across the country to help us build this. So we think of tonight as like an exposure. Some of you may know this stuff already. Some of you may be doing amazing work out there and we'd love to hear from you too. So we'll dive into some of that practice at the end as well. But we hope to send you off with lots and lots of different tools. Before we dive into this, one thing I like to do is jam pack a PowerPoint with a ton of links in the notes section. So because of that, and I see some of you have found it, I sent you an email right before this program started with the PowerPoint. You can follow along, you can look at the notes sections, you can kind of do whatever you want in there, but it's also for you to keep, you can download, you can save, do whatever you want with it. Um, but go to those links and check out those pages because we're just giving you a, like a sneak peek of some of the tools that we have. And there's tons of stuff online that has been developed, tested, and in the classrooms for years and working really successfully. So a little bit about the Constitution Center. So we were chartered by Congress in 1988. I love this story because I always want to like go in the way back machine and say, okay, we were chartered by Congress in 1988. This is a bipartisan initiative. We are signed um, by Reagan and that there would be a place within close proximity of Independence Hall that would teach the American public all about the United States Constitution. But to really get the full way back story, you have to jump about a hundred years before that to 1887. In 1887, the idea came up. It was the 100th anniversary 
of the signing of the United States Constitution. And they said, you know what? We should create a place that teaches all about the United States Constitution in a non-person way that brings people together to talk and discuss and to learn about the Constitution. And you know, you think about educational mandates, you think about acts of charters by Congress, and then you wonder how long would it take if everybody was on the same page and thought this was a brilliant idea? At least 101 years. <laughs> so 101 years later, they come back to it and they move forward with it. And it begins the story of the Constitution Center. Um, so we are a nonpartisan organization. In 2003, we opened our buildings very close to Independence Hall, if you've been to the center. And it's just about two blocks from Independence Hall on the most historic square mile in the United States. But we are a museum that houses some unbelievable, amazing exhibits. We're beginning the process of redoing our entire core exhibit, our main exhibit on the second floor. But we're more than just a museum. We're an organization that brings people together, just like you, for civil discourse and dialogue around big constitutional questions and around the big constitutional issues of our time. We bring the top scholars together. We bring um, children together. We had a fourth grader in our class today having a conversation with a former Supreme Court lawyer. So great conversations at all different ages through the museum, through our town hall programs, podcast, our online classes that we call the exchanges and our peer-to-peer -peer exchanges that lets kids talk to each other with a constitutional expert, but also listen to each other. And through our amazing professional development series, we have lots of things to check out, but it really began with this charter that there would be a place to talk and teach about the United States Constitution. The way we do that and kind of the process we do for that talks about the constitutional components of a conversation. We think about our learning theory that begins with a strong foundation in storytelling and uses the history of our country, the history of we the people to build a foundation of understanding our constitution, but also understanding the perspectives at the time and the perspectives today. We build on that idea and move forward by asking when people come with us either at a professional development or through a class or through an online program or a town hall, we begin those conversations and those stories with key constitutional questions. And this is what we have here is learning how to think and interpret like a constitutional lawyer. What's the constitutional question that you wanna be asked at this time and say, where in the constitution is the government given the power to do this? Or where is it given, where is the government limited in that constitutional question. We're gonna go through that throughout this process, but it frames all of our dialogue to ask those constitutional questions. And then our, our big job here at the Constitution Center is to create place and space for people to come together from different backgrounds, from different perspectives, from different ideological ideas, from top scholars to our fourth graders to come together and have a discourse and a dialogue on those constitutional questions and on that history of America. It's really important for us to frame it in this guideline because not only are we chartered by Congress to do this great work, but it is our mission and what we believe in and how we frame this foundational conversation in our country. So as we dive into those pieces, we can look through these three elements and you'll hear them in all the materials that we share, all the lessons that we develop, and really all the practice that we want to encourage in so many ways. Um, Kevin, I'll pause for a second and see if there's any questions in the chat that should be shared for all. We don't have any questions just yet, um, though we do have some comments about people who have either come to the center or are looking to come soon, uh, including one here who says that they got engaged at the center. Um, so just going through and commenting on everyone who we either are welcoming back, looking forward to having again soon, um, or look forward to the first time that they come to visit. Okay, getting engaged at the center is pretty awesome. Kevin, did you get engaged at the center too? So there's two people in here that got engaged at the center. I did not get engaged at the center, no. Um, we, we got married kind of right across the street and then took some pictures at that's the center. That's what it is. That, so that's 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 sort of <laughs> it counts. Big, big wedding plans at the center. We do do a lot of weddings too. On a side note, it's a beautiful view. Um, so a lovely place to um, get engaged. Congratulations to both of you. Um, so as we kind of keep moving through, let's begin 
with a walking tour of, you know, our favorite document, the Constitution, and go through it. So Tom, I'm going to tap into you here. And I think you said this earlier today, and I loved it. And you don't have to do a brisk jog through the Constitution. But it would be great if you kind of gave us a lovely, you know, walking tour, or, you know, straight, slow stroll through the Constitution. I was going to say, maybe a leisurely stroll through the there Constitution, but yes. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And so, you know, in many ways, the Constitution, it was written to be a document for all of us. It was kept short so that ordinary Americans could read it and understand it and revere it and, and love it and even think about how to make it better. So as we go through the Constitution, let's begin with the original Constitution of 1787, which gives us a preamble and seven articles. And let's start with the inspiring opening of the Constitution. It begins with that important phrase, we the people. And so there the preamble is it's expressing one of the deep foundational principles of the Constitution, popular sovereignty. The idea that it's gonna be a government that's driven by us, not a monarch, not the elite, not an aristocracy, but by us, the American people. And it's one of my favorite parts of the document because it's the, it's the brainchild of two of my favorite delegates to the Constitutional Convention. As a matter of principle, as a matter of theory, Pennsylvania's James Wilson was the great prophet of popular sovereignty at the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention and for the founding generation. And then the words of the preamble themselves came from the pen of the great penman of the Constitution, Governor Morris. Uh, so two of the really powerful figures in the Pennsylvania delegation and two of my favorite delegates to the convention. So I wanted to give them a shout out here tonight since I have a little more time than I usually do in our classes uh, during the day. So that's the preamble. It begins, it sort of lays out the big principle, the statement of principles for the Constitution. And then the Constitution becomes an instruction manual of sorts for how the national government, how it's gonna be structured and in many ways, how it's going to work. So articles one through three, of course, give us the three branches of government. Article one establishes the national government's legislative branch, Congress. Article two establishes the national government's executive branch led by a single president. And Article three establishes the national government's judicial branch, the federal judiciary headed by a single Supreme Court. Just to say a little bit about each of those provisions and sort of the founders broader vision, you know, with article one and with Congress, of course, Congress is responsible for making the nation's laws. But as the founding generation was thinking about constructing this new institution, they were, it was a really difficult challenge. Because on the one hand, what they wanted to do is they wanted to create a new national legislature that was stronger than the one that came before, than the national legislature under the Articles of Confederation. So as they were constructing Congress, they were thinking about what are some of the national powers that are necessary for this new government? Where are some areas in which we need the national government and the nation itself to speak with one voice and have a single policy? And so in that sense, Congress was going to be a fairly powerful institution. But on the other hand, they also wanted to make sure that it was an institution of limited powers. We didn't just cast off a powerful British empire to put in place a new out of touch elite in a distant nation's capital when most Americans never left their hometowns. And so we tried to strike that difficult balance. And part of what the founders then did at the convention was they took the legislative power of the national government and they split it in two. And so this is how we get the idea of bicameralism a, 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 a Congress that's separated between the US House of Representatives and by the Senate. And then those two bodies being organized around different principles, the House being organized around the idea of popular sovereignty, being the part of the national government that's closest to the American people, that they're going to be elected directly by the people and the number of representatives per state is going to be linked to the populations of those states. So the larger states have more political power in the House of Representatives and the smaller states have relatively less. The flip side being that the Senate is then organized around the idea of equal state representation. That's how it worked under the Articles of Confederation. And so with the Senate, we then provide voices often for the small states because every state in the United States Senate gets two senators. So that means whether it's California, a very big state, Rhode Island, a very small state, all have equal political power. And so I'll pause there, Curry. I don't know if there's anything else to say about Congress or anything you wanna add before we move to the rest of the, 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 the articles. Almost like two little small things. I just wanted to remind everybody, as you were talking about Wilson and Governor Morris, I always, in my head, Signers Hall pops into my head. So if we do have virtual tours of the museum, and I feel like we forget to share that all the time. So if you want to bring your kids into Signers Hall and do a walkabout in Signers Hall, talk through the three branches of government and who these people were, 
you can do that with us live um, and the kids can ask all the questions that they want. And then also just on the fun side note, Emily is related to James Wilson. Just had to shout that out out loud before we go into <laughs> it. So cool. I know, I knew you would love that song. And then we'll dive into, so sorry about that side little sidetrack there, but perfect lead up to article four. Absolutely. So, that, so we get through articles one through three. So we get Congress, the president and the Supreme Court. And then we have these next four articles of the constitution, which lay out you know, some odds and ends, but some also some really important processes. And so with Article 4, we address the relationship between the states and their citizens, how to handle the admission of new states, how to govern the federal territories, and also includes the infamous Fugitive Slave Clause. Article 5 is one of my absolute favorite parts of the Constitution. Uh, it's, it lays out the process for formally amending the Constitution. And this is a reminder that the founding generation didn't think that it had a monopoly on constitutional wisdom. They themselves, when constructing the new constitution, they didn't write on a blank slate. Instead, they wanted to look, they wanted to learn from some of the great political thinkers in history, and they wanted to learn from history itself, from both the history abroad, but also their own lived experience here. And so similarly, they hoped that we over time would learn from our experience as a nation and use the Article Five Amendment process to make the constitution better. Now they set a very high bar for amending the constitution. They didn't want it to be easy, but they wanted it to be possible that the American people learned from mistakes of the past, found better ways to construct the constitution they could come together and have a formal process for changing it without recourse to violence or to revolution. So, and then, so that's article five. Article six establishes the supremacy of national law over the laws of the states. It also bans religious tests for national, for, uh, for national office. And then finally, Article 7 sets out the process for ratifying the Constitution. We may rarely think about this, this particular provision today, but it says so much about the Constitution as a whole. Because what it tells us is that the, when the framers came together in Philadelphia at the Constitutional Convention to craft this new Constitution, they were there for months. They had brutal battles in certain ways. They, they, they were, there was constant threat of the convention totally breaking down. It brought together some of the finest minds in America from Benjamin Franklin to James Wilson to Gouverneur Morris to the greatest figure in the nation, the most revered, the most popular George Washington. They come up with this document that we have today that have, have governed our nation since then. What they told us through Article 7 is that at that moment in time, as they left the convention, that what they were providing was just a proposal. It was a proposal to the American people, as Madison said, it's worth nothing more than just a piece of paper in front of him sitting on a desk unless the American people themselves breathe life into the document. And so they laid out a process for ratifying it. They sent the document back out to the American people. The American people could then say yes or no, acting state by state in ratifying convention. And they came very close to saying no, there were really, really close votes in important states like Virginia, Massachusetts, New York. But ultimately, they said yes. And it's a reminder that from the preamble to Article 7, the fundamental foundational principle of it all is popular sovereignty. We, the people, and we have this constitution because we, the people, said yes. And Tom, I love that. And I love how you always connect it back and forth to this idea of popular sovereignty, this principle of what we're based on, beginning with the people and ending the, the structural constitution, the original constitution with we, the people. When and we, the, everybody was talking in the chat about coming to the center, if you ever wanted to know why that center, the core exhibit, the main exhibit was a circle, that was the reason why. They wanted to show how at the beginning and the end, it was always about we the people. And that's why they made that giant circle. I know in theory- I had no idea. <laughs> in theory, it, sound, it sounded brilliant. When I learned it, I was like, oh, that makes sense. That's really cool. In, you know, in reality, the kids use it like a racetrack. But however, it is a really, it was, that was the point of it. So I love when you point that out and make it so clear. Now that the next kind of area that we're gonna jump into is all the amendments and we've kind of like grouped them for you. And everybody, we do live classes and peer to peer classes that are pretty much private classes for you in another class okay. on all of these topics. So you can dive into article five, you can dive into ratification, and you can dive into the, our favorite class, or at least my favorite class, I think it's yours too, Tom. Um, 27 amendments in 27 minutes. Super fun class because you have to go really fast. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, no, the, the oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So was there a question? We thought we heard somebody. I think it's oh. okay. 
Okay, yeah, no, okay, no problem. So yes, so now we have the original constitution, but we also have the 27 amendments. And so it's a reminder that we, the people have used the amendment process to transform the constitution in ways both very big and relatively small. So I mean, right, be, right after we ratified this new constitution, what's one of the first things that this new government, this new Congress did? It proposed a series of amendments, a series in, in the end, what wound up being the first 10 amendments to the constitution our Bill of Rights, it emerged, the Bill of Rights in many ways emerged out of the debates over the Constitution itself. And so there were, you know, there were spirited debates as to whether or not to ratify the new Constitution. And one of the anti-federalist key arguments against the Constitution, these are the people opposing the Constitution, was that the original Constitution did not have a Bill of Rights. This began with the dissenters at the convention itself, people like George Mason, Elbridge Gerry, Edmund Randolph, who refused to sign the Constitution, part of the reason was because there wasn't a Bill of Rights. Furthermore, once we got into the first Congress, it was then James Madison who took the lead in constructing a Bill of Rights for the new constitution. He himself wasn't necessarily convinced that a Bill of Rights was necessary, but what he did is he learned from the series of constitutional debates before the constitution was put in place. He, he knew that the Federalists had made certain promises to the Anti-Federalists that they would look at their, their objections to the Constitution and try to make the Constitution better. And Madison himself knew that an important feature of this new republic was going to be to ensure that those who opposed the new Constitution, that opposed the new government, felt heard, felt part of the process, felt as though the new government was going to hear them, listen to their objections, try to make the Constitution better, and as a result, bring even the dissenters into the fold into the fold of this new government and ensure that if, even as they disagreed with government policy that they would do it within the new constitutional system rather than outside of it. So the Bill of Rights ultimately enshrined some of our most cherished liberties like free speech, religious liberty, a jury right to a jury trial, but it arose out of this amazing constitutional conversation that happened around the ratification of the constitution itself. So that's the Bill of Rights, Curry. The next series of amendments, just to quickly flag, are the three amendments that we ratified after the Civil War. These transformational amendments, many scholars refer to them as America's second founding. We fought a bloody Civil War, and then we put these amendments in place to try to set important and better constitutional baselines for post-Civil War America. So this includes the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, the 14th Amendment, which promised freedom and equality, and the 15th Amendment, which promised to end racial discrimination in voting. And in the case of all three of these amendments, they were the first amendments added to the Constitution that actually increased the powers of Congress. These amendments said that we are putting these new promises in the Constitution. We know that they aren't self-executing, and so we're going to give Congress the power to try to realize them. And of course, we know they weren't realized even in their own time. We saw a turn against Reconstruction and many of these promises for decades upon decades, but ultimately through years of toil and bloodshed and courage, eventually we saw many of these promises realized in the civil rights movement and key landmark statutes like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But of course, debates over all of these issues continue from, from really from the beginning of the Republic all the way up until today. And then finally, Curry, there are other amendments that have been ratified that do other things, both big and small. One to flag is the transformational amendment, the 19th Amendment, which protected women against discrimination at the ballot box. And we at the Constitution Center have an amazing exhibit on the 19th Amendment struggle called How Women Won the Vote. And it's really, it's an amazing story. And it's a story of both, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a long a push over more than a century to make our Constitution and our, our American democracy better. And it's a reminder of how federalism, harnessing state experimentation can sometimes lead, lead to big constitutional change because the women's vote began out west in the western states. It eventually extended into the east, and then eventually we would write that promise into the Constitution itself. Um, that was awesome. And just and be, since we're on a theme about uh, exhibits at the center, you can virtually tour that 19th Amendment exhibit. But the, also we have a Civil War and Reconstruction exhibit that goes through the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment and the drafting table where you can dive into the layers. So Kevin will put those links in the chat um, and you can visit those. And Tom worked on both of those exhibits and they're my two favorite exhibits at the Constitution Center. So Tom, as we think about like kind of these big ideas that we look at the Constitution, how do we kind of wrap these big ideas around in understanding the Constitution as a whole through uh, across time? 
Yeah, so it's, it's again, it's for us, it's the big ideas that, uh, you know, sound constitutional thinking, it begins with an intimate con uh, knowledge about the Constitution itself. We want to understand its text, its history, its structure. And that's, that's through all of our work, all of our classes, all of our materials, we try to provide teachers and students with those resources so they can engage in constitutional dialogue and importantly understand that a lot of the constitutional issues before our nation today, they're not new, they're also not easy. And that what we try to do is when there are reasonable arguments on all sides, even though we all, we're all smart people who are engaged with the constitution and with our country and care deeply, but to try to understand as best we can, not just our own position, but to understand the position of others, even if we choose to disagree and choose to stand by what we believe in, to ensure that we're being really fair and charitable to all sides that are that are that all sort of reasonable parts of the debate and therefore try to enrich our own understanding over time. Awesome, thank you, Tom, that was really helpful. And so when we think about this, and we talked about this briefly earlier when we were going through that three pillar system that really holds up the way we write our educational materials, frame our constitutional exchanges as well as our town halls. We, what we do is we kind of, the technique of a constitutional lawyer, we ask our students to say, okay, what we want you to do is pull apart kind of your constitutional views from your political views. So we want them to begin with asking constitutional questions. They typically begin with a statement like, can the government do that? May the government do that? We have a, like a little trick for it. And we always say to people, if you hear yourself saying, oh, I think we should do this, or I think we should do that, that we and that should is typically gonna be a policy or a political question. There's nothing wrong with having a dialogue around policy and political questions. It's unbelievably important. But what we wanna do is we wanna frame and get, build a really strong foundation with our students, starting with our history, looking at the constitutional question and saying where in the document is that part given power? Where is it given a limitation of that power? Is it even a constitutional question that, at all? To understand our history and to understand where in the constitution this lives, we begin with the, can they do that? Should they do that? May they do that? Those questions, the may and the can. So those are those like kind of key constitutional questions. So we always like to give an example and I find the fourth amendment is probably spot on the easiest to do with students when starting with this, because they they really teach us those base clean constitutional questions. So a policy question around the Fourth Amendment in a school would be, should a public school principal search a student's locker? The constitutional question on that is, does the Fourth Amendment allow a government employee like a public school principal, the ability to search a student's locker? That is how you kind of separate those two and begin with that discussion around the constitutional question. So Tommy, what I'm gonna ask you to do is kind of dissect the constitutional question for the, everybody and help us see where does it kind of help clarify why this is a constitutional question and is written kind of in this depth to give you a little bit more meat to stabilize you in a constitutional question. Yeah, so I think it's it's what you said at the beginning, Curry, that is, is I think is almost always the best way to think about any of these questions. So this one here, we're dealing with the we're dealing with a government employee, a public school principal, we're dealing with a, the Fourth Amendment, a key part of the Bill of Rights. But more broadly, what we want to ask when we're talking about government action more broadly, whether it's Congress, whether it's the president, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a principal, the first question is always, do, where do they get the power to do what they're doing in the first place? Do they have the power? Can they do that? That's the first thing you want to ask. Um, and so here, you know, you would say, broadly speaking, you know, public school teachers, public school principals have pretty broad power in the context of education to do a ton of different things. The same way if you were asking about a law passed by Congress, you know, you would look to things like the taxing power, the commerce power, et cetera, to see whether or not something like a bank of the United States falls within the powers of Congress. You begin with sort of that question of, Where's the power coming from? And then you ask that follow-up question, which is, are there other parts of the Constitution, even if the power may initially seem there, are there other limits written into the Constitution that may cut back on this power? And so here, the key, the key, in this particular hypo, the key example would be looking at the Fourth Amendment and seeing how it might apply to this particular situation and what sort of limits it puts in place. Often what you get from that provision of the Constitution, whichever provision it is, 
is it's often something, it's a question that's often arisen in the past. So you'll have some combination of the text, sort of the history around why we have that text to give us a sense of sort of the scope of the right or the power that's involved. Then you might have a series of cases by the courts over time that have given that particular provision life in the law. And through that, you can then analyze the question under the constitution of whether or not the power is there or not. And furthermore, in that context, how is the power either magnified or how is it limited? Awesome. And that leads me perfectly to the next section, which is the part that I absolutely love the most. I always think about this as like a check, like a list of boxes and you have all these choices. And when you're trying to figure out a constitutional argument and see if it's a sound quality, strong constitutional argument, you can go through this long list and we'll dive into each one of these separately and say, does it check this box? Does it check this box? You know, it doesn't have to check all the boxes, but a really good sound constitutional argument might check multiple boxes. So one of the things that we like to, you know, talk to teachers about, talk to, you know, at the general public about, and also talk to our students about, is when you're coming up with a constitutional question and then you're engaging in a dialogue around that, Think about your constitutional arguments. And this is how a way you can process through that, almost a list of different ways you can look at constitutional arguments and say, where am I getting my, um, my backing for, my you know, foundation for a strong argument? What did you say earlier, Tom, today? I was like cracking up, I love the line, and now I can't remember it for the life of me. I don't know. He said, it, oh, it has to cut the constitutional muster. That's what it was. Oh, yeah. The, uh, whether, yeah, whether there's constitutional muster. That's right. So if you want to have a good, strong constitutional muster or whatever it is, use these lists. So forms of constitutional arguments. You're going to walk us through each one of these. But again, everybody that's in the conversation, feel free to, we're going to pause after each one if there's any questions about clarification, because these do get a little tricky, at least in my mind we can pause and kind of clarify and give examples of that as well. Tom's great at giving examples. So walk us through all of these. Start us with the text, where we all sure. start. Sure, yeah, and so j just to, just to uh, do my due diligence, I'll say that these categories are, they're, they're meant to really capture constitutional practice. And so what these are, they're really the constitutional lawyer's toolkit of sorts. And so in analyzing any constitutional question, I always, I really do, I like to go through each of these and have a sense of, which way the particular arguments are cutting? Is there one side of the argument that's stronger than the other on any given issue? And frankly, when you're dealing with a tough constitutional question, text and history may cut one way, doctrine may cut the other. But what these categories allow you to do is to really think candidly and clearly about where the cross currents are in the conversation, uh, where the cross currents are in terms of the constitution's meaning and to not hide from, the con from really the complicated trade-offs that are sometimes involved in reaching constitutional decisions. These categories are adapted from Philip Bobbitt's book, Constitutional Faith. They're, they're, not, they're not exactly the same as Philip Bobbitt's categories, but he's a great constitutional theorist at Columbia University. He came up with this idea that really, if we want to understand constitutional law, you should understand it as a, a convention of argument. And that to really understand what it is to be a constitutional lawyer is to understand the form of argument that lawyers use over time. And so what we're trying to do here is to give you the different conventions of argument. Different interpreters weigh them differently. Some of these uh, categories are more broadly, viewed as more broadly legitimate than others, but all of these would be absolutely recognizable to any constitutional lawyer. I just want to give that preface first, Curry, as to where these are coming from, whether we're just making them up from all cloth or like sort of where they all fit into uh, 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 thinking like a constitutional lawyer. Sounds you good? might, yeah, the only thing I will add is you might see a little bit different ones depending on which the kind of deep dive that you do, but these are the ones that really have strongly bubbled up in the Constitution Center says like these are the strong based ones that you should see over and over again. Yes, and so the first category here are arguments from the Constitution's text. So with this form of argument, the interpreters look into the meaning of the words of the Constitution, relying on common understandings of what the Constitution meant at the time in which the, that particular piece of constitutional text was framed and ratified. The goal here is to discover the best reading of the Constitution's text at the time of that framing and ratification moment. So they're, they're, you're talking about a different time period if you're talking about, say, the original Constitution versus the Reconstruction Amendments. They were framed and ratified at different times. So when you're trying to get back at the meaning of that text, you want to really put yourself in the mindset of that particular time period. 
So what sort of things might you look at there? Well, you might look at period dictionaries. So you might look at how those particular words, what they meant in dictionaries at the time. You may, might read broadly literature from that particular era to understand how the words are used in context. But this is really the part of constitutional argument that's looking at the words in isolation and trying to have a firm understanding of what they would have meant to the, re to the generation that framed and ratified them. So we always begin with the Constitution's text. I'll pause there, Curry. Sorry, I was trying to remember Philip Bob, it's the name of his book that he puts the, um, some of these in. Is it uh, Constitutional Interpretation by Philip Bobbitt? It's constitutional fate. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, everybody, I'll drop it in the chat in a minute. So the text, I love that example, Tom, where you talk about like going back in time and, and looking at a dictionary of that moment. Would you also like, would this also be the way people like have conversations around this, these words at this moment in, in commonplace? Or is Absolutely. it just, yeah. Got it. Yeah, no, you want, you, you want to basically understand the words themselves and how they're used conventionally in that particular, in, you know, sort of in that particular time period. That's what you're looking for with the text. That's that first, in, that's that first source of authority, that first sense of meaning you're looking to. Of course, it's not going to solve every problem. It's not going to resolve every constitutional issue, but you want to at least begin with that particular foundation. Awesome. Does anybody have any clarifying questions around the first category text before we move on to history? Because sometimes these get a little confusing to me, so that's why I love diving into them. Anybody? I have terrible wait time. Okay, go ahead. The history. Okay, so so yeah, we began with text. Text. You're right, though, Curry. Text and history often run together, and people who value textual argument quite a bit often value history as well. And in many ways, these are the most broadly accepted forms of constitutional argument. They would unify. So you hear in in constitutional debates and public discourse, there's often debates between originalists and living constitutionalists and they have different visions of the constitution, but really all sides would say, you wanna know a lot about the constitution's text, but you also wanna understand history. And so with this form of argument, the interpreter's looking to the historical context when the constitution's text was drafted and ratified to shed light on its meaning. What sort of sources might you look for when you're looking at constitution's history? You might look at the records of the constitutional convention for the original constitution. You might look for battles over the amendments in Congress if what you're looking for are, you know, the debates around the proposals of different amendments to the constitution. You're gonna to wanna to look at the discussions in various ratifying bodies. So, you know, that's gonna be the ratifying conventions with the original constitution, but it could also be the state legislatures as to nearly all of the constitutional amendments that are ratified. You might look to a period's newspapers and pamphlets um, and different essays written around the ratification and debates over, over different uh, provisions of the Constitution to understand how people at the time were talking about them. And by studying these materials, you're looking to understand sort of a, a, a few different things you want to have in mind when you're doing history. One is you want to understand the key factors driving the push towards constitutional reform. So if we're looking at the original Constitution, that would be something like understanding some of the critiques that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention and those arguing in the ratification debates, the critiques they had of the Articles of Confederation and sort of the different ways in which they're trying to address those defects in constructing a new constitution. You might want to understand the paradigm evils that the ratifying generation was seeking to address. So if you're looking at the Reconstruction Amendments, you'd want to understand a lot about that generation's concerns about ensuring a new birth of freedom for African Americans after eradicating slavery and after winning the Civil War. You might want to understand any broad principles that a particular provision was looking to add to the Constitution, what those reformers were looking to add to the Constitution. So this could be something like the broad promise of equality in voting for women through the 19th Amendment. That would be sort of a broad principle that would be associated with the 19th Amendment. And finally, you might look for any evidence of how the, the framing and ratifying generation expected the provision to apply to specific issues. So here, think about something like the Fourth Amendment the founding generation and concerns about unreasonable searches and seizures by government officials. You'd want to understand a bit about that context. So that's text, that's history, and all together what those two things are really trying to get at is to understand both the words themselves and the history that gave rise to those words to understand the founding context about each provision of the Constitution. Remember, we're not always talking about 1787 or 1789 different amendments are ratified in different periods. So sometimes you have to dig deeply into other parts of American history to understand certain parts of the constitution, whether that's reconstruction, whether that's the progressive era or some other period. 
So if anybody has questions, just feel, raise your hand in the, um, the icon and it'll pop you up to the top so I don't miss you. But um, Tom, real quick question. So would people who are, you know, structure originalist um, art um, arguments, would they fall in that text and history category the strongest? Usually traditional originalists say Justice Antonin Scalia would most value text, history, and we're about to talk about structure. A lot of originalists will also use structural argument as well. Got it. Okay, just wanted to like add that clarification. Okay, structure. Go to that one next, please. Sure, so structural argument, this form of argument. Hang on one second, I lie. Oh, sure. <laughs> Lucas raised his hand. Thanks, Kevin. Awesome. Uh, Tom, I have a quick question. Um, so you mentioned we could reference the debates um, of the first Congress. Um, I asked a professor about this once, and they said there's no, quote, reliable record from the first Congress about these debates about the amendments. So does the National Constitution Center have something on that that's a reliable record for it? No, no, and that, not, not for all provisions of the Constitution that wouldn't be true. There are some debates in the first Congress. I believe it's in the House of Representatives. There are some debates. So if you look in the annals of Congress, but we don't have records of anything in the Senate. Furthermore, I would say if what you're looking for is the original meaning of the Bill of Rights and understanding um, from a historical perspective, what's going on there. Often you might learn more from the debates around the ratification of the Constitution itself, where a lot of these ideas are bubbling up from, rather than what's happening in the First Congress. Because the First Congress, there's, there's, there's not as much evidence as you would want there. Um, if, you look, if you're looking for some of those resources on the Bill of Rights, I would strongly recommend Neil Kogan's uh, compilation called like the Bill of Rights. It has some very generic name, like the complete documentary history or something like that. But he's comprised everything from the different drafts of the amendments to whatever was said on the floor of, around each of them. But it's really the best single resource I can think of on the raw materials around the Bill of Rights in particular. But you're right, diff when you're trying to understand the history of different provisions of the Constitution, there are strengths and weaknesses as to the historical sources you can rely on. For instance, I'm an expert on, well, to the degree to which I'm an expert on anything, I'm an expert on the 14th Amendment and the Reconstruction Amendments more broadly. And what I wouldn't give to have a documentary record of the debates of the Joint Committee on Reconstruction as they're hammering out a lot of the details of the 14th Amendment. Instead, we just have the drafts, but we don't have what they actually said. So we don't have Madison's notes for the 14th Amendment in that sense. So we have to make do with the historical materials as best we can. Thanks. Can, can we point them towards the drafting table? Will that at least give them a little bit of Neil Kogan's work without having to dive into those beautiful blue books? Yes, so the, uh, writing rights is, uh, yeah. is it, it, we have a, a tool where we put a lot, we put Neil Kogan's drafts of the Bill of Rights, so the actual text that was debated over time, and also some of the state constitutions that gave rise to that text. It's online on our website on our Writing Rights Interactive. The last plug I'd have on history is if you're really interested in the Reconstruction Amendments, our great friend of the Constitution Center, Kurt Lash, who's a professor at the University of Richmond, has put together a lot of the primary source documents as to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. That's just out the last year or so, but it's an amazing resource, and it's one that he lent to us to create our own drafting tables on the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which you can find on the Interactive Constitution. And everybody, yeah, you can go through the Interactive Constitution and for writing rights, it, you go through the First Amendment, whatever amendment it is, and then two writing rights. It's a little awkward to get there. Kevin, I'll drop both of them in there. Um, one question from Leah that I really loved, and I just want to ask you as you go through this, Tom, are any of these arguments better than others? Or that can be flipped on the other side. Are any of these arguments weaker than others as well or used less often, one might say? I would say, I would say there's, you know, it'll depend by interpreter and by judge and by scholar as to which are stronger and weaker. I would say the ones that here are here on the first screen, text, history, structure, and doctrine are the ones that are most broadly used and most widely accepted. And I can't think of many constitutional lawyers that wouldn't say you'd want to know something about each of these features. The ones that you'll find on the next screen and many interpreters use, but some challenge their legitimacy outright. And so they're important to know because um, one, you may think, you yourself may draw the conclusion that based on the Constitution, based on the proper role of interpreters and even the courts, that they're a proper way to interpret the Constitution, but they're more contested than these first four. Awesome. And one more before we move on, and I promise we'll get to structure in a second. Corey brings up a part of the conversation we were having on Tuesday, that it seems that the definition of textualism is changing. While Scalia preferred the term, he acknowledged there had been some, there had to be some interpretation. It seems like Scalia and Alito are both more true believers in strict textualism. 
you did this thing on Tuesday when we were teaching that class, Tom, where you kind of explain there, even within these groupings of originalists, you still have a range of different interpretations. Can you kind of just give us a beat on that? Because it's not going to be like, I know, I'm sorry, not to flash you back to that long discussion on Tuesday, but even with each in each category, there's still variation. Um, and I know when students look at these lists, they really do want to use it like a rubric that they can follow and plan, but they're still gray and it's complicated. And that's a big piece of what we should be teaching them too. So will you just take a beat on that? And then I promise you'll be allowed to get to, and, and Corey just uh, said Thomas, but um, to structure next. I will not get bogged down in theories of originalism. I could talk about it for a really long period of time. I think what's important to note is whether it's textualism, whether it's originalism, the, the categories sometimes blend together in popular discourse, but I would say, let's call originalism the big category. I would say all originalists would agree that the text and history are the most authoritative source in interpreting the constitution. But there's great disagreement even among originalists. There are different forms of originalists. And with that, there's sort of a great disagreement even among originalists about how much the text and history settle versus not. And then also, if you find that the legal resources of text, history, and structure leave a question unresolved, they disagree over what you do next and the weight of other sources of authority. So some originalists would say if the text, history, and structure don't provide a clear answer, then there's no role for the courts, and the courts should simply defer to what the elected branches have done. That's sort of one view. Another, and you see this, you saw this in the oral arguments around the New York gun case that was argued either last week or the week before, before the Supreme Court. But there are certain originalists that would say, okay, there's text, history, structure. If there are still some questions that remain, we might also look more broadly to tradition which is a form of argument we'll talk about in a little bit, but to sort of understand how a particular provision has been used over time might shed some meaning on the best way to apply it over time. And then finally, some originalists would say, okay, if text, history, and structure are you know, somewhat indeterminate, maybe we'll rely a bit on doctrine and sort of see what the courts have said over, over time. And so in that case, sort of turn to um, well-settled precedent to decide questions. But anyway, originalists themselves will say, yes, you must know the text, history, and structure of the Constitution. They disagree on how much that might determine, even sometimes which parts of history are binding versus not. And then furthermore, most importantly in many ways, what you do when the text, history, and structure don't settle every constitutional question. Awesome, okay, structure and doctrine, dive in. <laughs> Okay, so we have text, we have history. So structure, what do we mean by structural argument? So with this form of argument, the interpreter apply, uh, I'm sorry, with this form of argument, the interpreter reads the constitution holistically and tries to derive any structural principles embodied in its text. Now that sounds a little vague, but what that basically means is, you know, there's no specific separation of powers clause in the constitution, but it's possible to derive that structural principle from the constitution as a whole and then apply it in specific cases. Now, if we're looking at, so what's an example of where structural argument has played a key role in constitutional debates? You know, one classic example, I think, is Chief Justice Marshall's interpretation of the Constitution in McCullough v. Maryland. So there, what the Supreme Court's trying to figure out is, is a bank of the United States constitutional? Does Congress have the power to charter a national bank? This was the great debate in many ways in the early Republic from the Washington administration all the way to Marshall and McCullough, and then all the way to Andrew Jackson after that. Everyone argued over this because it went really to the heart of how do we read the constitution and how much power does the national government have? And part of what Marshall does is he makes a structural argument. He has the famous line that, remember, it is a constitution we are expounding. It can't partake of the prolixity of a legal code. The general idea being, we want the constitution to look like this, not the federal code of regulation. We want the, the constitution itself was meant to be a document that everyone could read. It was meant to be fairly short. It wasn't gonna be thousands of pages. And part of, the, part of what follows from that is that not literally every jot and tittle of powers and rights are going to be listed in there. And we know that in part by the text of the constitution itself with article one, section eight and the necessary and proper clause. And so what Marshall effectively says is because of the constitution as it exists, its structure, what we know about it as a whole, it tells us something about how we should read it tells us something about how we should read Article 1, Section 8, and the Necessary and Proper Clause. It tells us something about how we should read the powers that are specifically listed in Congress. And as to the Bank of the United States, what Marshall then says is based on this basic structural principle, 
What we can know is that there's going to be certain implied powers for Congress. And so when we read the necessary and proper clause, we need to, and we, we consider a law passed by Congress, we should see if there's a fit between what that law does and whether you know, the power it's employing is important, an important means of carrying out one of the powers that's listed in the Constitution itself. So it's Marshall relying on a structural principle to tell us more broadly how to read te the text together, read between the lines of the text, and how to settle a really big constitutional question. Of course, the flip side is this was a contested constitutional issue in its own time. Thomas Jefferson disagreed. James Madison disagreed, and it goes to big questions about the powers of the national government and Congress that go from the founding, really before the founding, but certainly to the founding, all the way up until today, everything from the Bank of the United States to Obamacare. So anyway, that's, that's at least one example of how structural argument can work. Cool, you wanna roll right into doctrine next? Yes, so doctrine's a very simple one. Structural is a little complicated one to give a specific example. With doctrine though, it's what we think lawyers do. I mean, this is basically, this is the lawyer's work. It's what do lawyers do? We read a bunch of cases. We read a bunch of cases. We try to understand what do those cases say? What are the principles that apply there? And then we take old cases and apply it to new cases. And so that's doctrinal argument. I mean, it's something, if you look at something like Brown versus Board of Education, that, that it, it does two things. One, it takes an old case plusy and says, we're not doing that one anymore. So it overturns precedent. It sets a new broad principle about desegregating the schools and a vision of the 14th Amendment. And then it takes it from the school context and applies that broad principle to a bunch of other cases in different contexts. Awesome. Okay. Now we have um, three more to go through. And again, these are a little, a little trickier, but also kind of help kind of fill in the gaps in between those first four. And then I have a big question for all of these when we're done. Okay, so we have text, history, structure, doctrine, and now we're moving into prudence or consequences. This is exactly what it sounds like by its title. With this form of argument, the interpreter is seeking to balance the costs and benefits of a particular ruling, including its practical consequences and how it relates to a judge's views about the proper scope of judicial power, competence, and role. If you're looking on the current court, who's a, who's a prudentialist who really likes prudential argument, the great friend of the Constitution Center, Justice Stephen Breyer, um, is really in many ways the great prudentialist on the court. And he said in a law review article a few years ago, this is how he described the importance of consequences in his rulings. He said the real world consequences of a particular interpretive decision valued in terms of basic constitutional purposes play an important role in constitutional decision making. So Breyer saying all of those other things we already talked about, text history, structure, doctrine, they matter. But for Breyer, he says, we also have to take into cons in consideration the practical consequences of our rulings. Now, there are justices who looked at Breyer and have looked at Breyer right in the face and said, Justice Breyer, that is the wrong, that's an illegitimate way for judges to go about their business. You shouldn't be doing it. Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer used to have this traveling roadshow where they'd argue about constitutional interpretation. And Scalia would say this all the time and he'd say, Justice Breyer, use text in history. That's the only legitimate source here. And they disagree. Uh, but there certainly have been plenty of justices, not just Justice Breyer, but plenty of justices in history that have looked to prudential or consequentialist arguments. Awesome. Tradition? So tradition is a form of argument that you're seeing, I think, increasingly at the Supreme Court uh, these days. So I, it's one that I would continue to keep an eye on. Um, with this form of argument, the interpreter is looking to any laws, customs, and practices established after the framing and ratification of a given provision. So, so much scholarship and so much constitutional interpretation deals with founding moments. So the founding itself, reconstruction, understanding those contexts. Tradition says, of course, we want to know those. That's historical argument. But part of what we also want to understand is how have constitutional provisions been used over time? What are the actual practices of the national government, state governments, local governments? What are the practices and views of the American people over time? And so what are the kinds of sources that you're looking to in, in, in arguments from tradition? You're looking at things like state constitutions. What sort of rights have been enshrined in state constitutions over time and how do they relate broadly to fundamental rights that aren't listed in the Constitution, or how might they relate to the actual rights that are written into the Constitution itself? We want to sort of understand what have the states said over time? What are different laws that have been in the books in states over time? How have states either enforced or not enforced the laws that are on the books? And, you know, just to give some concrete examples of how this is cashed out in history, you know, think about a couple of terms ago, the Supreme Court decided a case called the Town of Greece versus Galloway. The question was, does legislative prayer, basically prayer at the beginning of a town council meeting, violate the First Amendment's Establishment Clause? And part of what Justice Kennedy said in the majority opinion is, uh, one, the conclusion was, 
no, it doesn't violate the First Amendment. That sort of practice, as done by the town of Greece, was constitutional. And part of Justice Kennedy's argument is that we've had these forms of prayer in government settings, both by Congress and by state and local governments, for a really long time. And it's just something we don't want to unsettle without really, really good reasons. So that argument from tradition, in effect, uh, influenced Justice Kennedy's conclusion in that case. Another example, though, would be something like the Griswold decision dealing with Connecticut's law against contraception. Part of the power of the court's uh, 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 decision there striking down that Connecticut anti-contraception law was that it looked at the landscape of laws in the country and it said, Connecticut and Massachusetts are the only states that have laws like this. Furthermore, Connecticut itself doesn't even enforce the law. We had to create a test case to even get this thing into court. In the end, this is just something we don't do in America anymore. It's inconsistent with the American constitutional tradition. Connecticut's an outlier, so its law has to go. Awesome. I love the examples. They're great. And then morality. Is this, do you see morality a lot? Like what, this one feels uh, like it could be really complicated in today's conversations. <laughs> Yeah, so I would say prudence, tradition, morality, all contested forms of constitutional interpretation. Morality may be more so than any of them. Morality points in a couple of different directions when we meet it in the constitutional concept, context. So here, some of, the, some of these arguments are arguments from uh, 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 rights that are derived from the natural law tradition, so looking to history and philosophy. Others are drawn from a judge's own independent present day moral judgments. So if you're looking for a practical example of this in constitutional decision making, you're often looking for a justice that's probably not a textualist, not an originalist, doesn't care a ton about doctrine or tradition, but really is looking at broad philosophical principles. And so we see this sometimes in the opinions of Justice Anthony Kennedy. So an example would be his opinion in, uh, his part of the opinion in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which is a key landmark abortion rights decision. And so what Justice Kennedy basically says there is we're interpreting the liberty uh, you know, part of the due process clause. And as we're doing that, Justice Kennedy says in, in like a broader sense, liberty has to mean the right to define one's own conception of meaning of the universe and the mysteries of human life. And so for Kennedy, not just in a case like Casey, but maybe even a, a case like a Burgefell dealing with same-sex marriage, he would see this as embodying sort of a deep principle of autonomy and dignity. Of course, on the flip side, from Casey onward, over and over, both in public settings and in judicial opinions, the late Justice Scalia would absolutely mock this argument by Justice Kennedy. So again, it was contested on the court itself, but certainly, there are, there are scholars that defend the use of some forms of moral argument in constitutional decision making, but plenty of people criticize this as an illegitimate form. But again, for us, for purpose of understanding the constitutional lawyer's toolkit, it's important to know which, you know, really all of, you know, all of these arguments and understanding that though contested, you will find them in judicial opinions, in scholarship, and more broadly in discourse around the constitution. Awesome. And that's what I, I think is one of my favorite things to do with students is to look at the this list and then have them read opinions and dissents and look for where they can tag it. Like, oh, look at, look at, I think that's tradition. Oh, I think that's textualism and pull it through. And I think the Briar cheerleader case is a really fun one to do it with too, um, as a newer one. But when our students do look at these and we've heard our, you know, the students do this over and over again, they like to put things in boxes. They like to keep it really clean and clear. And that's not always how it works. So when thinking about this and having students apply it, what would be some of the advice that you would give the teachers or the students on how to use these, these forms of interpretation so the kids don't get overwhelmed, but also don't organize everything into one category or the other? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Curry. I mean, the way I always look at these is what these different forms of argument are about. It's about understanding sort of the art and practice of constitutional argument. And so just like if you're a musicologist, you have certain tools in your toolkit to understand a work of music and why it works or why it doesn't work. It's so the same with constitutional argument. This is our way of understanding the craft of different legal opinions. I would say more broadly as an interpreter, to be a good constitutional interpreter, part of the argument throughout um, sort of uh, constitutional education and constitutional practice, it's often that you want to be both candid and principled when interpreting constitutional issues. You don't want to simply, basically, they, you know, traditionally you would say people are doing it wrong if they say, I like consequence X and therefore I am now going to just jerry-rig all of these different categories to come to the conclusion I want. Now, sometimes as a lawyer for a client, that's precisely what you are doing. 
You're trying to take the forms of constitutional argument that are strongest for your client and you want to present them and you want to minimize the ones that are big, the biggest problem for you. So as a matter of a practicing lawyer, you know, part of the practice is understanding the weaknesses of your own case. So that's why you want to go through each of these categories and understand in great detail where you're strong and where you're weak. And then when constructing your argument from the perspective of persuasiveness as a lawyer, you're going to emphasize the strengths, the, the strong parts of your case and try to minimize the weak parts of your case. But more broadly, as just a candid interpreter, as an ordinary citizen trying to understand constitutional issues, we shouldn't delude, delude ourselves. I think candor is the most important thing. Candidly acknowledge doing these the analysis under each of these forms of argument and candidly acknowledging where the outcome points in one direction versus the other. It's not as though at the end of the day, it's then going to just be a simple thing. It's going to be self-evident what the right answer is in some sense. But you will at least have a very good sense of the contours of the argument. And in the end, be able, maybe be able to say something about wh which side is persuasive or unpersuasive. And frankly, on most constitutional issues, we're talking most of the constitutional issues we want to talk about. It's more like 60-40 than 100-0 or 90-10. And so like uh, this, again, Justice Breyer is a great example of one of the justices on the court who's really, really good at both reaching a conclusion, because he has to, he's a judge, it's his job. But in his opinions, acknowledging the parts of his argument that are the weakest, most contested, and where he has to make certain judgments about choosing one versus the other when there are arguments on both sides. Oh, and I love it. And that rolls us really nicely into the next part when we're going to talk about having civil discourse and dialogue. And that's, and that's what Breyer is so unbelievably good at, is not just being able to say what's my perspective and my side, but listening to the arguments from different perspectives and different sides. Um, and I, I know, I'm glad that the teachers are enjoying this and this is fun to kind of go through. I also love reading Kagan's because Kagan at times will go through all of them and tick through and say, this is why, or this is why your opinion is wrong. And let me show you in every possible category how it doesn't work. So a really kind of strong way to see that as well. Um, so tips for engaging in constitutional conversations. Do you want to give the, the one, two, three real quick, Tom, and then we can kind of wrap up with any constitutional questions and dive into civil discourse. That sounds great. So yeah, these are just a few tips for engaging in constitutional conversation. The first is just to be sure that you're asking constitutional questions, not policy questions. This is, again, this goes back to Curry's example from earlier, sort of the, you know, does Congress have, you know, do, do the government, does the government have the power to do X um, versus the policy questions, which are more, should the government do X? But it's really trying to make sure that you're pitching your questions at that constitutional level and not asking policy questions. That's one. The second is that you want to try to steer clear of yes or no questions because they're rarely going to move the conversation forward. They tend to be conversation killers. And then finally, and this is where we try to provide as many resources as possible for teachers and students, is that you want to incorporate scholarly work into your answer, because this evidence is going to help support your points. So you want to do your research, you want to take notes, you want to, again, I, like I said, you really want to read the best arguments on both sides, because the best forms of analysis are going to take into account the weak parts that are exposed by the opposing side. And then finally, as you're presenting your arguments, you want to highlight the information that you've taken in from the scholarly sources. And in part, what you're going to want to do when you're making a constitutional argument is you're going to, going to want to tick through some of those conventional forms of argument we just talked about. You want to pull out from scholarly work, from historical evidence, et cetera, different things that go to the Constitution's text, history, structure, doctrine, prudential concerns, tradition, and morality. Awesome. And, and just to make sure you don't feel overwhelmed by this one, two, three, we do have on our interactive constitution, you go to the in the classroom section, there's 31 different modules that tee up multiple constitutional questions that tee up scenarios and hypotheticals, which we know we all know the kids love scenarios and hypotheticals. Well, let's be honest, everybody loves scenarios and hypotheticals because they're fun. Um, but also there's briefing documents in there that can give you a lot of that history and those constitutional um, arguments on, on different perspectives. So all of that's there for you to pull from. So you don't have to go searching everywhere for every single lesson. You can begin there and pull a lot of ideas out. So Tom, thank you so much. That was really helpful. I know you have to jump in a minute, but real quick, does anybody have any kind of follow-up wrap-up questions before we dive into the civil discourse part for the last 20 minutes? Okay, I think we're good. Tom, thank you so much. That was unbelievably helpful. Um, this was great. All right, thank you so much, everyone. And uh, happy constitution reading. <laughs> awesome. And um, Emily, I can give you a list of readings um, 
on the something on 101 level on this and I'll we'll follow up with an email to everybody as well because Tom has a great list for this too. All right. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so let's dive into all of that great work. You know, you can do all the deep work in the history, you could do deep work in constitutional questions and all those pieces, but where the rubber meets the road and where it matters even more is how they apply it in a civil discourse and a conversation. So what I wanna do in the last 20 minutes is um, begin with just showing you a few different activities that we have on our website and our civil discourse toolkit that we have as well. But I wanted to open it up to everybody and just ask kind of some basic questions. Um, what, what's an argument? What does it sound like? What does it look like? And how does it feel? This is typically where we start with a lot of our students to kind of frame the understanding of a discourse and a dialogue by beginning with what is an argument and how does that feel? So really quickly, just shout it out, no pun intended there, um, any kind of uh, answers to these questions. And just unmute yourself and go nuts. <laughs> Hello. I, I'm there we really go. I'm going to jump over the oh. argument part and say, what does it sound like? It's a discussion. So that I jump right there, but I still have a good answer for what's an argument. <laughs> Sorry. Got it. But you know what, what I love about this is everybody. So the word argument has lots of different connotations in everybody's head. So when you hear the answers to the following three, you really hear what the person's definition is. So an argument or to you, it sounds like a discussion. Great. Go for it. Somebody yeah. else. I, I was going to say that in our classroom, I think an argument is where people are acknowledging each other's ideas and thoughts um, before expressing their own um, and giving um, giving approval um, or at least um, thought to what the other person is saying before they are expressing what their ideas are uh, with regard to the same topic. Awesome. That's fantastic. It, so they're recognizing, acknowledging, and in, implied in all of that is really being active listeners when the other person is, is sharing their opinion. Yeah, it's really hard for middle schoolers to, <laughs> uh, to do that, but we teach them that the first part of their comment should always be, this is what I heard you say. Oh, you know, it's amazing that you're doing it with middle schoolers and it's really hard for adults to do this too. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else with an argument? Um, I guess I, I interpret argument just a little bit differently of the overall question. So like when we look at Supreme Court cases and we look at that overall question that the judges have to answer or address, to me, that's the argument that we're looking at rather than a discussion. It's your kind of your overall themed question and then everything under it is how you respond to that question, what evidence you use to answer that question. So that's kind of how I look at the word argument. It's a little bit different than a discussion. I don't know if that's right or not, but that's kind of how we view the argument part. Yeah, and there's really no right or wrong here. So this is what I love about this question. So we talk often, and you'll see it in our civil Dis dialogue toolkit, and that toolkit is a cornucopia of resources, but it's talking about positionality. So what is your position when coming into a discussion on a topic from where you bring it and your experiences in life? And so what I love about this question is you can hear people's different positionalities and how they've engaged in argument, in argument before. Um, and so has anybody had a different or a varying answer on an argument? So far, so far we've heard like two different ones. I teach high school. And so for me, one of the things we, we talk about when we're looking at analyzing even arguments is the reason, logic, and evidence. And as we look at that, we also sometimes, depending on what argument we're looking at, is the, the background of the person that, it was, that wrote the argument and took the time to write it out and what they have been through. And I think sometimes looking at some of the greatest moments 
and um, and civics have started from an event and for that's unfortunate and it is mm. and has pushed us forward to be better humans and to look at the constitution's weaknesses to create the arguments that are necessary for the future fantastic that's an amazing share um, when we did this activity on tuesday we had a group of fifth to eighth graders from camden um, in new jersey and we had a group of penn students so they're all like probably a range from 20 to 22. When we asked them, what is an argument? What does it sound like? What does it look like? And how does it feel? They answered completely different. They said, it sounds hostile. It sounds like you're fighting. It sounds like, what does it feel like? It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel welcoming. So as we think about building an argument and engaging in an argument, we see these things in different lights and different perspectives. And so that's why we really wanna understand kind of the perspectives that everybody is coming to the table and how we're building these words because you all are doing it the way you're building and defending a perspective for an argument for and more learning and moving it forward. And there is the, the guy that basically invented action civics. That's what his line was about an argument. He says, you, you don't come to the argument to win, you come to learn. And it was one of the best lines I ever heard and have ever kind of like held on to. It, it reframed my understanding of what an argument is. But so often it begins with what's our perspective. And I love that you do that when looking at primary sources around arguments or secondary sources. What is their perspective that they're coming to the argument and where they're coming from as well? When we think about these, we come to the conversation around words like civil discourse and civil dialogue as well. So for this activity, we kind of put up four different definitions of what is a civil discourse. So going from what's an argument, and that can be anything from a difficult, a difficult dialogue to um, building, a, building an understanding of where people are coming from and a perspective. But on the other side of that, to engage in a civil discourse, so I want you all to kind of read through these four really quickly, and then just tell me which one resonates with you the most or which ones resonate with you the most and why. So I'll give you a minute. Okay, so why don't you do this? You can put in the chat, we'll start there. If everybody wants to put in the chat real quick, which one, so it's one, I should number these, one, two, three, four, which one or multiple do you, does really resonates with you? And then I'm gonna just ask a few of you to share why. Oh, four's getting a lot of love right now. <laughs> Okay, Ryan, you were first, so I'm gonna call on you first, if you don't mind. Um, you said two and number four. Um, do you wanna share what was it? A, what, what was the reason why number two and number four kind of called to you? Yeah, no problem. Um, so I think in the conversations that, you know, the other the educators shared earlier, that I really wanna to stress to my students that dialogue, especially in the civic nature, needs to be not just speaking, but listening as well. And that requires those attributes that are listed there under number two from Davis. Um, and then to, I think, especially with everything that's gone on over the course of the last several years, and especially within the last year, that that willingness in number four to explain your views and reasonings and that commitment to listening to others is something that I think society wise that we need to truly like inform our students that this is a worthwhile thing. It isn't about winning the argument like you guys talked about earlier. It's about can we, it's almost like finding the pride in listening to others and really celebrating that. So that's why that resonated so much. 
I love that. Finding the pride in be, being an open listener. I think that's unbelievable and so unbelievably important. And we have to give our kids practice in doing this. This isn't something that's innate. Um, it's not something that's instinctual. It's actually instinctual to do the opposite. I love those reasons. Um, does somebody else want to share? Maybe Allison, do you want to share why number two spoke to you? Um, I picked number two um, because the mutual respect piece kind of stuck out to me. I feel like right now, lots of us are not respectful for each other. And I try to talk to my kids about being respectful. And so that's the piece that I really, really liked in that one. Perfect. And mutual respect is something that, again, you, you know, you can say it in words, but you have to show the behaviors mm -hmm. and so the actions that help build a mutual respect and what breaks it down at the same time. So Josh, you picked number one and two. Do you want to talk about what spoke to you in one or did somebody else want to go? Yeah, I mean, for number one, you know, at the end of the day, that goal to advance the public interest seems to have really been lost. Uh, I, I, I mean, looking at school board meetings and looking at just the toxicity, and I, I do believe in the need for honest, frank, and constructive. And the reason I added number two is also that mutual respect. Uh, so I said, I ended up saying one and two because I do like the mutual respect piece. But it seems we have forgotten what the goal is. And in many ways, you know, I, I tell the kids this, politics has become too similar to a football game where it's your team either wins or loses. It's not about like what's good for the country necessarily, but about those two, um, two sides. So, yeah. Um, I'm laughing at Allison who um, said her kids are sticking their tongues out. That's all right. They, they're, <laughs> they're trying to work on the civil discourse at home in her, at her home right now. Um, does anybody else have anything from one of these that you want to kind of pull out that somebody hasn't shared yet? But that was, I agree with you. There's something that honest and frank that is so unbelievably needed at the same time to balance respect and listening. So like, how do we balance honest and frank with respect and listening? Because we need all of those things to, to have a freedom of discussion and a freedom of conscience that shares lots of ideas. Um, okay, I see a hand up, go for I'm it. Look, I'm sorry. Oh no, go ahead, Debbie, and then oh, we'll go to the hand. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I, um, I resonate with number four and a lot of it has to do with claiming and caring for one's identity because I think um, our kids are really forming their identity and what they think and being able to claim that and, and stand by it and be confident in it, um, but still also listening to others. And maybe you change what you think based on what you hear others saying and just that willingness to um, hear and to assimilate what other people are saying into their own thinking um, is something we definitely prize. And I wish one of them had that word change in there in some, cause that is a huge, there's like, there's a tonalness to it in that last one. But I think, I mean, I'm gonna defend the Wikipedia one here a little. And so what I think I love about the Wikipedia one is the engagement. Because that, that means sharing, that means giving back and forth. And that, that also implies a willingness to change your perspective because you're allowing somebody else to open your eyes or open the doors wider for you. Um, I, Leah, do you have a, a, something to add? Yeah, I think at least in, well, in, whether it's the eighth grade history class or my AP Gov class, you know, when we get into these heated discussions, we're in a huge one right now of slavery in the constitution and whether or not it should have been there and whatever. And, and I'm constantly saying, well, back up your view with facts, show me something, you know, either from, you know, court cases or reality or whatever, show me something to bet. And don't just say, I don't like it, or it's dumb or whatever, you know, arguments can get into with middle schoolers. But show me evidence of, you know, follow your, follow your ideas with facts. And then that usually ends up kind of calming down, you know, the heated argument and opens up people's minds. Because when you show them something concrete, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, now I actually see your point of view rather than 
not listening to you because you don't have the same side. So I would say that whole explaining views and reasons and using concrete facts um, is, is so important. Awesome. And then Lucas, did you have, would you like to share too? You know, I just, um, I originally had the fourth one and then Debbie uh, explained it very well. Um, so I'll just add on to her amazing explanation of it. Um, I really like the identity piece. Um, and I also like the degrading someone else in the process piece of it too. Um, I think agency is really important in our discussions. And I think sometimes our students are afraid to use their individual agency to inform them. Um, like we were just having a conversation about the 19th Amendment in my classes. And when we're doing these readings, I think a lot of the girls that identify as female in my class really resonate with them. Um, but a big part of that discussion is, okay, you're going to feel a lot of these things these authors are feelings. And with the people who identify as male ask questions, you can't see it as them being ignorant. Maybe they're trying to reach a deeper understanding of what's going on. So using that agency and that identity to further your understanding can be very beneficial to the classroom. And I think there's a, a fine line and a hard line that we have to always walk with, you know, kind of weaving those last, your last two statements together of how do we ask students to come to this with, you know, evidence and facts and build an argument, but at the same time also respect that these are emotionally charged conversations at time and that there will be emotions connected to it. Um, I'm a very emotional person. It usually rests and sits in the world of happiness, but I, I can't give you my argument without a whole bunch of emotions and usually typically my hands moving around a lot. Um, and so a lot of the kids do that too. And how do we successfully help them be able to pull both of those into the conversation and dialogue and respect that? Because in, in a way, when a student is bringing their emotion to the conversation and healthy emotion, we don't want it to be destructive, but it still comes as a part of my, it can come as a part of my identity too. And making sure that we all feel welcome as we walk through those pieces and giving them opportunities to find their voice as they go through that. Some of these really difficult conversations and topics. Um, and this is a part of what we started to unpack last summer in our Summer Teacher Institute around civil discourse and dialogue. We looked at methods, we looked at different big constitutional questions, but a part of it is we put all that pedagogy around it about how do you build safe spaces in your classroom so students can feel comfortable to be frank, open and honest, but also feel comfortable to say, you know, that, that makes me feel a certain way when you say that, and this is why and where we're coming from, and you balance those constitutional questions. We're going to wrap up in four minutes, so I'm going to like sneak peek you through a couple things real quick. Uh, the toolkit is in here. I will add it, Kevin, if you don't mind, dropping the toolkit link into um, the chat because you're amazing at that. But in this slide here and underneath in the notes, one of our students at Constitution High asked Justice Breyer, um, do you guys argue? And Justice Breyer, if you click on this image, you'll hear Justice Breyer walk through how they have an argument. And it was very much connected to what you all were saying earlier. Um, he answered it right away. He said, Are you, what you really want to know is do we, do we argue and do we fight? No. Do we have arguments about things? And he broke those two apart and kind of separated it for the student and answered some of the rules that they follow in the Supreme Court, but also some of the norms that they have set up for each other and to ensure healthy civil discourse and dialogue. So the, the difference between a norm and a rule, a rule is a standardized list that is predetermined that we will all follow. So a really funny one from the Supreme Court that I love to share with students is that the newest justice um, is the one that if somebody knocks on their door has to get up and open it no matter where they are what they're doing no matter what that's a rule that has a rule been a rule for a hundred years the newbie has to open the door when it's knocked on um, the the norms of it and the norms of the conversation are what he goes through um, during that short video and he talks about they're never rude to each other they have set up a respectful dialogue that is always civil and polite and professional and that they always listen and he he walks out for our students kind of a three two one and what we like to do is have our students listen to this and come up with your own classroom norms your own classroom 
non-negotiable rules. So here's our rules. They're non-negotiable. They're at the table. Here's our norms that we believe that we are going to stay to. And the things that they said at the Supreme Court was they say, come, they listen to each other. They try to deal and ensure they're listening to what they're saying, not what you're going to counteract with that, that you write it down and you deal with what she's saying or what he's saying. And that everybody speaks once before um, everybody, everybody ensures that everybody gets a chance to speak once before you go to your next kind of uh, numbering and staying calm on those pieces. So it's a really helpful tool to kind of energize a dialogue and a discussion around it. But it is also one that we constantly look at almost every single time we have a civil discourse and dialogue and say, are our rules still rules that we want to apply? Are our norms still norms that we want to apply? Are there ones we want to remove? Or are there ones we want to add? And that always reminds me of kind of the, the methods that you're going through. Are we setting up tradition for our classroom and saying this is how we behave? So we typically ask ourselves like, what is a norm? What are some of the norms that we use in civil dialogue? And then what is Breyer's advice and how do, can we build that into our own norms? So as we kind of wrap up real quickly, um, anybody wanna share a norm that's in your classroom that your students came up with? One of my favorite ones from the Constitution High students that we work with all the time, their norm that I have stolen made a rule in my classroom when I teach directly is you step up and you step back. Um, and that, that is like a call to action in two ways. Number one, it is a call to action of when something in the conversation needs to be enhanced, needs to be added to, or needs to be pushed on, that you step up and you share that information. You share your argument, you share your information. But at the same time, you step back and allow others to take that space and that place. I absolutely love that the kids came up with that one. It was my favorite one and I stole it and we use it in our college sessions now. Um, so brilliance from the ninth graders. But are there any that you have found that your kids have come up with that are really successful that we could share with each other? We just really encourage our kids to respond without judgment. Um, if they respond, it, you know, we, we definitely praise them to respond without judgment. And that's not always easy when you feel passionate about a topic. Um, and so we, we really encourage them and we give them the, the verbiage to use with each other to uh, have that conversation. We have a policy um, It is inspired by TLC because it was playing in the background when we came up. It's called No Scrubs. So for those of you who don't know the song, No Scrubs, I mean, list what a scrub is in the line. Um, if you're hanging out with your friend's passenger ride, like, so like th disrespectful things like cat calling, like attacking someone's personal, who they are as a person. Um, and so we, we say whenever someone starts doing it, when it starts getting personal, we say, you know, no scrubs, which inevitably leads to someone starting to sing that song, which is also nice. I love that you're bringing that song back too. So I love so many parts of that, that, um, that norm in your classroom. Leah, do you want to share the um, writing down part? Yeah, we, I always give them um, a pad of legal paper when we start an argument and um, I have them divided in half. And, um, and I have them say, you know, side one, side two, they can write down our side, your side, whatever they want to write down. And as the other, they're not even responding, they're writing down what the other argument is. And so you are listening and writing rather than thinking about what you're going to say and just by them writing down as it goes, taking that, you know, even I teach them a little bit of shorthand and write as it go, cause I was a debate, I was in debate. So I I'm teach a little bit of shorthand and that way when they're done, then they have to look over it. And that way they don't think about what they're gonna say as the other person's talking, which is a very typical thing to do. Um, they can't, they don't have time because they're busy. Um, and then they can respond. So that's, we started that years ago, particularly in my AP Gov, because we have lots of arguments and my middle school classes, we've started that and it seems to work pretty well. 
I love that. I love that active method of using your brain to, to listen and giving students a way to be active, but still be in that listening mode. It's called downloading what your brain naturally does. Um, so your brain, it, when you hear an argument, your brain naturally starts downloading responses and putting through the process and going through kind of like your file system of how to answer that. And it's a hardwired system that we, our society has set up for our brains. And so you really need to do the behaviors. And I love that behavior that you gave them and teaching how to do the shorthand as well. It really helps them stay active listeners and isn't just saying be an active listener. This is how you can redirect your brain, redirect your neuroscience to help you be active listeners. So really awesome method to share. Thank you so much. Oh, Josh, you want to share what um, waterfalls are? Because I absolutely love that. And I think that would be a great way to wrap up. Uh, I, I can't find, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find what I can do for the song waterfall. Oh, you meant the song waterfall. One of our teachers, so I'll tell you what a waterfall is in my brain. Um, oh, so waterfalls are, if you're ever on a Zoom with your students, and I've been trying to figure out how to do this in the classroom because I loved it so much in, um, in the classroom, I mean, in the Zoom rooms, is that when you ask a question or somebody sharing a debate, everybody can type it into the chat, either the reaction, the response, or a comment, but you don't hit enter until, a certain, until the person is done. And that stops your students from reacting to each other and keeps them focused on what the person is sharing and then you hit the button at the same time you say waterfall and it fills the chat box up really quick and it's a great way to kind of look at it see it and then everybody takes a pause and processes a little and starts pulling out if they see any similarities or differences in the waterfall of answers so it's a really fun way to kind of get kids to keep listening but also get kids to not react and have answers that just complement or distract or combat each other in the chat as well. So everybody, this was a fantastic session. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, we're gonna add all these links. We'll download the chat. We'll add the links to the PowerPoint. You all should have a copy of the PowerPoint as well, but this was fantastic. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm sorry I kept you five minutes over on this Wednesday night. You have a few more days to get through this week. But it was a wonderful conversation, so many great questions and so many great shares along the way. So thank you so much. And Kevin, you are just an awesome, awesome link person in that chat. So thank you so much for being the support. <laughs>